Um, welcome everyone. Um, so last week, we um, the lecture was focused on uh, the introduction of uh, graph neural networks. Um, we developed uh, spectral and spatial um, graph neural networks. And this week, uh, we will study some recent developments um, in GNN architecture uh, in the last uh, two years. So here is the uh, outline um, of the talk. So first of all, we are going to um, we are going to talk about um, Westphaler Lehman um, uh, graph neural network GNNs. Um, then we will uh, we will speak uh, about expressivity power and universal approximator. Um, we will also uh, study graph positional encodings. Uh, link prediction with edge representation, and we will uh, we will finish with uh, GNNs for for sets. So let's start with the um, uh, Weisfeller Lehman uh, GNNs. So for this, I need first to introduce the um, uh, problem of um, graph uh, isomorphism. So graph isomorphism. Um, uh, so the goal is basically if you have two graphs like this, graph number one, graph number two, uh, you would like to know if these two graphs, which look like different, they are actually the same. Okay. So if they are the same, there exists actually a permutation of the indices. Uh, so you see that, for example, uh, this node is the fluorine and it has index one. This uh, node is the carbon, it has index two, hydrogen index three. Okay. So you can you can reorder uh, basically um, the indexing of this uh, of this molecule, a molecular graph, and and by indexing, if you are able to preserve, you know, um, the neighborhood. So, for example, the fluorine and the carbon are the are you know neighbors for this graph and this graph here. If you preserve this neighborhood structure, then it means that these two graphs are isomorphic. Okay. Um, so. So the question is, um, is there an algorithm um, that can uh, tell us if two graphs are isomorphic or not? So this is actually an open question. Um, we don't know if there exists a polynomial time algorithm um, that can tell us if two graphs are isomorphic or not, or if the problem is actually too difficult if it is an NPR um, uh, problem. Um, so, uh, so there was um, the first algorithm uh, uh, introduced to test if two graphs are uh, isomorphic or not was proposed by uh, Weisfeller and Lehman. Uh, it was uh, some time ago in uh, 1968. And, and, and this test um, is going to tell us if two graphs are uh, not isomorphic. So how does it work? So the core idea of the WL test is basically to design um, a coloring function. So I'm going to have this coloring function f. It's going to take as an input a pair of uh, node, okay, i, and the neighborhood j. It's going to take the colors of i and j, and then it's going to output uh, a new color uh, for uh, the node i. Okay. So this function um, will basically act on um, so the the central uh, node i and the neighbor. So the neighbors uh, basically is a multiset, so it's a set of unordered and repetitive uh, possible repetitive elements. Okay, so to produce this coloring process, um, we want uh, we want two conditions. The first condition is that uh, we want, of course, to produce the same color if uh, you know uh, C i and the C j are are the same. Okay, so if you have this uh, graph here, um, and this is i and the rest are, are j. The same here, so you, we want to produce exactly the same color. So your CI is the is the fluorine, and the CJ are you know two at two atoms of carbons and one uh, oxygen. So you see that um, the order can be different, but we don't care about uh, the order. So we produce the function f. We produce the same color. Now, if we have um, uh, we still have the fluorine, but we have different neighborhood one one carbon and one oxygen and two carbons here. We want to produce um, two different colors. Okay, so they are they are the the, the conditions uh, for this coloring process. Um, so simple. I mean, 
simply said, it's we won't have to be injective. So if we have you know different inputs, we want to map to uh, different outputs. And injectivity is the key property here for um, uh, discriminate non isomorphic graphs. So so we have this function uh, for coloring uh, you know uh, the nodes depending on the neighborhood. And what we're going to do is that we are going to apply this function again and again until we create no new colors. Okay, so we start with this graph. Uh, so we have, uh, it's a molecular graph. Okay, so we're gonna see uh, this node i, and then um, I'm gonna see the, 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 na the neighbors, which are the two atoms of, of carbon. So we get the color, for example, red. For this um, node here, um, the neighborhood are these two hydrogens and this fluorine is gonna have the color orange. So for this, um, for this node is going to be the same color as this one because it has the same neighborhood uh, and so on and so on. Okay, so you, you got this uh, coloring um, of the graph at this step number one, and then you just, you know, keep going uh, with this uh, function. Um, and at some point, what happened is that there will be a step where you cannot produce more colors. And these steps, what you're going to do is that you're going to just to count the colors created um, by this process, and it's going to be a canonical representation of your graph uh, by this histogram of colors, which are here. So, so, so what we're going to do is that if we want to compare two graphs, so we are going to, to apply the same, um, you know, uh, process to a new graph. This is the graph number two. Again, we will produce, you know, um, um, uh, an histogram of colors, which is going to be here. Okay, and then what we simply do is that we compare the two histograms. If the two histograms have different um, are different, then it means um, the WL test uh, is guaranteed that the two uh, graphs are not isomorphic. Okay. Now, if the two if the two graphs produce the same histogram like this ones, then it's possible they are isomorphic, but it's not uh, it's not guaranteed. Okay. And there are ways to improve that. Uh, I will come back to, to this. Okay. So. Um, can we design um, graph neural networks uh, based on the on the WL uh, test? Uh, okay, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, but you may ask, you know, um, the process look like you know um, quite simple, quite deterministic. So why do we need a learning process? Do we need actually a learning process to solve, um, you know, to 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 implement the WL test? And the answer is uh, actually we don't need um, a graph neural network to do that. It just, um, it's actually uh, uh, easier to design this coloring uh, process, this coloring function uh, in a learning setting. And, and the other advantage, which, which is actually uh, the most important one is that, so first of all, um, uh, you know, distinguishing uh, non isomorphic graphs is not necessarily very important uh, in practice. What is, what is very useful is actually the coloring process because the coloring process is going to generate you know, um, uh, rich features uh, for, for, for the nodes. And we are going to use this, um, you know, um, this rich representation of, of, of the graph uh, for downstream task, uh, downstream task like uh, graph classification or graph regression. And she's, you know, what, what is uh, quite useful. Okay. So, so the implementation of this idea of, of um, the WL test as a, as a graph neural network uh, was uh, introduced um, by, uh, by Xu Hu, Leskovec, and uh, Jigelka uh, in 2019. And, and the idea is basically, uh, you know, uh, implementing the uh, coloring uh, uh, function here that we already talked about. So, um, so, so the question is, how do you, um, how do you, uh, what is the, uh, you know, the, 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 the shape of this, uh, of this function here? So this function is called um, for GNN an aggregator function, uh, and what we want basically, we want this aggregator function to satisfy these two conditions. So you will have a unicolor for the same pair of, you know, uh, feature i for feature j and different color for feature i and feature j. So again, what it means, it means that this ag aggregator function uh, must be injected. Okay, so if we look at, you know, aggregator functions, uh, the, the simplest one, so for example, the max, um, you know, uh, function, so you're going to take, you know, uh, the max value over your neighborhood, 
So the thing is, um, this is not an injective function. And you can see that you know on these two simple uh, graphs here. So this is the, the graph number one, the graph number two. Uh, if we compute, you know, HI for, uh, for this um, node uh, here, and we have, you know, uh, the, the neighbors, which are G1 and G2. And here you have the, the color two and the color minus three. If you take the max, then you will get two. And, and if you consider now this uh, graph here, and the, the HI will have, you know, the same uh, value is gonna be two because it's a max again. So the problem is that these two graphs are different, okay? So, so you don't, uh, you should not have, you, you must not have, you know, the same representation for this node and this node here. They must be different. But if you use max, you will have the same one, okay? Um, in, for this graph, um, if you use max, it's not gonna work, but also if you use the mean, uh, the mean value over the neighborhood would be the same for these two graphs. So again, you will not be able to differentiate these, these two graphs. Um, so max and mean are not uh, injective, but sum is injective, okay? So the sum uh, operator will be um, uh, the important uh, operation here. Um, and again, so here we can see the problem, you know, uh, as, um, you know, at the null level, but um, injectivity is something that if you, if you, if you have it at the null level, then you will be able, you know, to get also at the graph level. Okay, so, so, so I come back to the question. So can we design um, a graph neural network that is maximally expressive in the sense that can we design uh, a neural network that is able to distinguish between two uh, non-isomorphic graphs with respect to the um, Wesleyman uh, failure uh, test? Okay, the answer is yes. And such, um, you know, um, function f uh, is gonna have this, um, uh, this um, this uh, this equation here. Okay, so for this again, we want f to be injective. Uh, f will be injective if g uh, the function g is injective. Okay, so g is a function that we apply on the feature of i and the feature of j. So this function must be injective. The sum we know the sum uh, is an injective uh, operator, so it's fine. And here um, we want you know to differentiate these two terms. So the way you can differentiate if if your epsilon is uh, irrational like the number pi, uh, for example, okay? So if we satisfy these conditions, everything, uh, this function will be injective, whatever, you know, the situation of the uh, features, uh, hi and hj that, that you, can, you can encounter. Um, okay, so now uh, it's important to see that it's not easy uh, to actually design an analytical function for, uh, for g. Um, there are um, uh, difficulties related, for example, to uh, the upper bound of the neighborhood size for countable colors. Uh, also, if you, if you want to use one hot encoding, that's, that's a natural choice. You don't have any meaningful distance between, between the features. Okay, so, um, so uh, a natural choice uh, that we do uh, in our network when we don't, um, when the function is hard to compute is to uh, use an MIP, a multi-layer perceptron. Okay, because then we can use this um, important universal approximation theorem that guarantees that uh, this function G uh, exists. Okay, uh, but it's an existence uh, result. Uh, so for example, we are not guaranteed that a stochastic gradient descent will be able uh, to find it. But anyway, uh, it exists. Um, okay, so we have an MLP that we will apply, you know, on the HI and HJ with the sum uh, operator. So the epsilon, it's not possible to compute an irrational number uh, with a computer because you have, you know, uh, the representation with bytes. Um, so what happened is that you are going to learn the, uh, you know, the, the epsilon uh, during, uh, during the learning phase. Okay. Okay, good. So now we have um, the HI, which is the node representation after, you know, L layers of uh, the previous uh, aggreg aggregation function. Um, then now we need to, um, you know, um, um, reduce um, the nodes to a, a single vector. So the way we can do that, you know, is again to use the sum operation over all nodes uh, in your graph. Okay. So again, this is a, um, this is a injective. So everything's fine, and you use an M a natural MMP, you know, for uh, to go from, uh, you know, um, the D feature uh, dimensions, and then to reduce to K. Uh, dimension. So k, k is one if it is a regression problem, k is 10 if this is, for example, the n-list classification problem. Okay. 
So, but you have you can you can you can keep this uh, mental picture in your mind. What happened is that um, so the, the the gene this graph neural network is going to take as an input um, a graph structure, and then it will map this to a point in a space of k dimensions. If the two graphs are isomorphic, you know, um, ideally they should be mapped to the same point. If the two graphs are different, then they will map to, to different uh, points. Um, okay. So this is actually um, uh, a pioneer work um, on the theoretical question of, you know, uh, representation power or discrim discriminative power of graph neural networks. So, um, so there was this work by, um, by Gene. There was also the work by Maurice uh, and his co-author um, on this very important theoretical question. So you know, what is the representation power uh, of graph neural network? Okay. So following up on, on, this, on, on this work, and there was uh, recently the principal neighborhood aggregation um, um, uh, work uh, done by uh, Corso, um, Peter Velikovic and, and, and their co-author. And the idea was to extend uh, the gene um, you know, uh, performance. So, so the idea is, okay, can we generalize you know, um, the, the sum aggregator function to use you know, um, more diverse um, um, you know, aggregators. And, and there was also the idea of uh, using a degree scalar that I'm going to explain in, in the next slide. So aggregators, the idea is, uh, okay, let's use the most common aggregators, like you know, the mean, the max, um, uh, the mean and the standard deviation. And, and then they prove that uh, overall the function is injective. So you guarantee the GNN to be you know, um, expressive um, and as discriminative as uh, the WL test. Um, and, and, and here, you, know, you just increase the expressivity power of um, uh, you know, the, the gene uh, and you preserve here the, the linear complexity. So remember what I said last week is that, um, so um, the, the traditional uh, graph neural networks, so they are called the message passing uh, graph uh, neural networks. And, and they are uh, basically you know, linear complexity for the memory and also for the speed. So this is something that can scale up to uh, billions uh, of, uh, of nodes. Okay. So let me give you an illustration um, of uh, aggregators used uh, in the paper of principal neighborhood uh, aggregation. So for example, so you have um, here two graphs, okay? This is graph number one, graph number two. And then what you want, you, you want to have, you know, a meaningful um, node representation of, uh, of V here and here. And you're gonna, you're gonna see, you know, uh, the neighborhoods. So you have like uh, two nodes, U1 and U2. And for each uh, neighbors, you have some feature. So here the feature is just a scalar, two and two and four and zero. So what happened here is that they list, you know, the simple aggregators, okay? And, they are in orange when they fail, and they are in bold, you know, when they succeed. So, so you know, depending on the on the neighborhood structure, and also the um, the values of the features, then sometimes you know, uh, mean is going to fail, mean is going to succeed, uh, and so on and so on. Um, so the idea is, okay, let's use all these uh, simple uh, aggregators together. Um, so what they do uh, is basically they concatenate, concatenate you know, uh, the aggregator, uh, mean, standard deviation, max, and mean, okay? Um, and then what they use in their paper, they use um, scalars. So scalars is the idea of, you know, so let me simplify this equation, you know? So D is the degree. So the degree is simply, you know, the number of neighbors um, uh, given uh, one node, okay? So for example, one node can have, you know, 10 neighbors or it can have, you know, 1,000 neighbors. And alpha is the power, okay? So it's something like, you know, D to the power alpha. So when, when you take D and alpha, maybe, uh, you know, uh, power power one, so it's just D. So what you're gonna do is that you are going to amplify these uh, aggregators, you know, um, with um, the degree of, of the node. So sometimes it's good, you know, to amplify this, this signal. Or maybe sometimes you actually want to uh, decrease, uh, you know, um, the, the amplitude of this signal uh, by taking D uh, over uh, with the power minus one, so one over D. So you want to decrease uh, the amplitude of this signal, you know, with respect to the number of neighbors, okay? And sometimes you don't want to do nothing, okay? So you just put uh, identity one, okay? So they are just scalar, you know, to amplify or decrease the amplitude of, the, of these um, uh, aggregators here, okay? So here you just, you know, this is an, um, an outer product, uh, uh, yeah, tensor product. Then you just concatenate, you know, 
so you have four times three is 12, uh, you know, 12 uh, aggregators with their scatters. You got the 12 here, and then uh, basically, you know, DL is the dimensionality of your uh, hidden features. Okay. And then you have some parameters, W1 and W2, uh, to learn during the process. OK. Now let me talk about um, equivariant graph uh, neural networks. So um, graphs uh, are basically um, you know, tensor of rank 2. Okay, So they can be represented uh, in two ways. You can represent this as a list of edges. So if, especially if your graph is very sparse, you know what you want to do, you just want to keep in the memory you know, um, the, the edges. So they are represented by index 1 and index 2, index 1, index 2, uh, index 1, index 3, index 1, index 3. OK. Or what you can do, you can uh, also represent your graph as, as a matrix. OK. So if you have, um, you know, n nodes, it's going to be a, a dense uh, matrix of size 4 by 4. OK. And here you have uh, your um, node index 1, 2, 3, 4. OK. Um, OK, so, uh, so this, these are, you know, uh, uh, the graphs are, you know, represented by rank 2 tensors. Um, you, you can also look at different tensors, like, you know, if you look at vectors, so they are rank 1 tensor, and with vector, you can represent, you know, um, uh, ordered sets. OK, so the order of the, of the feature are important, or maybe, you know, uh, another set, so you don't care about the order. I will come back to that, you know, um, in the next uh, part of, of, the, of the lecture. Um, then you will have, you know, a general tensor of rank M, so uh, like 3D, MRI, or maybe hypergraph, okay? So they are, um, yeah, so it's, it's a vector, uh, Rn, and here is going to be a tensor of size n to the power n. Okay, so the most basic uh, graph symmetry um, is the invariance of the topology with respect to index permutation. So what I mean by that is, okay, I have this graph, you know, and this graph and the, the thing that is really important with this graph, you know, is, is this topology, you know, so how these points are connected to each other. This is really what, what is the most important structure here. Okay. So, so the index value uh, is completely arbitrary. Okay. So I need uh, index values such that I can store uh, the node uh, inside my computer, but it's something that is not, you know, uh, important with respect to the topology of the graph. So you see that. Um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to change the indexing. Here is index one. Here is going to be index four uh, by some, you know, um, uh, permutation matrix P. Okay, something like that. Um, so now this node uh, here is an index one, and this node will be index four. But you see that uh, I didn't change the um, my graph uh, topology, my graph structure here is is, is exactly the same. So um, so this is very important invariance is that the topology is invariant with respect to um, index permutation. Okay, so so it doesn't mean you know that your adjacency matrix. So uh, you know this is the connection. You have a connection between index one and index two, index one and index three, index one, index two, index one, index three. You know, so this will this will be changed when you change you know the indexing. Okay, so if you apply a permutation matrix P transpose here and P on the adjacency matrix, so the the the, the adjacency matrix here is going to be different to the adjacency matrix uh, here. OK. But the, again, the topology is the same. OK. So, so one thing which is important to, uh, to know is that all GNNs, you know, you can take um, uh, GCN by Thomas Keefe and Max Welling. Uh, you can take, uh, you know, a, a graph attention uh, network by uh, Peter uh, Velikovics um, and Joshua Benjo and, and their co-authors. Uh, they are all, you know, permutation invariant. What, what, what I mean by that is, uh, if you look at, you know, this graph with this uh, index, um, you know, um, this indexing of the nodes, um, then if you look at, you know, uh, this feature vector uh, for, uh, for this node here, this feature vector will be the same uh, here. Okay, so here I just change, you know, the indexing of the nodes. I don't change the topology. And what happened is that, um, the, the graph neural network will produce the same uh, node feature here and here. And this is very important. Okay, so all uh, graph neural network, they must be invariant with respect to uh, index permutation. Uh, otherwise, 
it's it's uh, you know it, you will need to uh, learn all possible permutation of your um, of your of your indexing, which is n factorial, which is just not possible. So so it's it's um, it's a very strong uh, you know um, property that um, all GNNs actually share. Okay, so. So now what I want is um, I have this property. This uh, I know that um, the topology is invariant with respect to um, uh, index permutation. Now I want to create functions that are you know invariant with respect to this um, invariant uh, to, to this to this um, index permutation. Okay. So there are two types of such functions. The first um, uh, type is equivalent functions. Okay. So let's say um, you know I have a, um, a, a a matrix A of the size n by n, I have only one feature, basically. When I apply the function f on, on A, okay, it will produce, um, you know, f of A. Now, uh, if I change um, the uh, indexing of my graph uh, with the permutation matrix P, uh, you know, P transpose AP, what I want is uh, if I apply the function f on this, you know, reparameterization of my, of my nodes, um, then I want this to be satisfied. The function where uh, p transpose a p is going to be p transpose f of a uh, p. Okay, so so this is an equivalent uh, function. So this is the way that um, this function actually satisfy. You know, they will preserve the index permutation. So we use usually these equivalent functions for you know uh, the middle layers, the hidden layers of the graph neural network. Okay, because Basically, you know, you you are just going here, for example, from uh, one feature to um, to also one other uh, to a new uh, to a new feature. Okay, but you you keep you 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 keep you know the graph uh, size, which is uh, n by n here represented by by a matrix n by n. Okay, so here I can give you an example. Um, let's say my uh, I have I have a graph which is here, and and the graph is going to be represented by a matrix A. So a i j will be the feature for the h i j. So for example, you know, for uh, for the node index one and the node index two, which are here. So the h feature is one two, and the value is uh, minus three. Okay, which is here. This is one two. This is minus three. Um, okay, and then a i. Uh, I'm sorry. So it's, uh, it's a typo. It should be a i i. So a i i is going to be the node feature. Uh, for um, the index one, okay. So it's going to be um, it's going to be three, the value the value of three, okay. So I have this um, you know um, this um, this graph uh, with the node feature and the edge feature represented by the matrix A, okay. And and then I can um, here I I have a function f which is equivalent. So um, the function f is defined as the matrix A multiplied by a matrix, which is the vector one multiplied by the one uh, vector one transpose. So it just, you know, um, um, a matrix n by n uh, full of, of ones. Okay. So uh, for this, uh, the function f will satisfy um, um, f of um, uh, p transpose AP is going to be p transpose f of AP. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, after equivalent functions, now I, I will have you know invariant functions uh, G. Okay, so again I have my um, my graph A, um, and then I'm going to apply you know my invariant function G. I will get, I will have G of A. So I will go from uh, you know um, a matrix n by n to a vector of size k. Okay, so if I apply uh, the permutation, the index permutation uh, P transpose AP, and I, I do G. Uh, p transpose ap then this time i will i will get g of a okay so here i don't have any uh, p uh, anymore because uh, i just have a vector right i don't have any more uh, matrix n by n i just have a vector so so if you satisfy if your function g satisfy this uh, equation then your function is invariant okay so again um, so g of a for example is going to be one uh, the vector one uh, transpose multiplied by the matrix a and multiply by the vector one. So you're just you know, doing the sum over all elements of your matrix A. Okay. Um, so function G satisfy, you know, uh, yeah, satisfy this uh, equivalent, uh, this invariant uh, equation. Okay. 
so there is something very important to um, to state is the, the notion of uh, symmetry and equivalence. Okay, so let's look at you know uh, images and computer vision. So the basic image symmetry uh, in computer vision is translation. Okay, so image content uh, you know is something which is invariant with respect to translation. Okay, so you have your your cat. If you move your cat, you know, to different position in your image, it will still be a cat. Okay, so this is this is the symmetry for this uh, for for image data. Okay, so what are the functions that actually you know preserve this symmetry, this translation uh, operation? Okay, so this is this is well known. This is convolution. Okay, so convolution is the translation equivalent function. Okay, and of course the um, the very successful uh, implementation of this function is the convolutional neural network um, by uh, Yann Lequin, Leon Boutou, Joshua Benjo, and Hafner, um, which is basically a translation equivalent uh, network. Okay, so this network, uh, and, and you see how it works again. So you have your function, uh, you apply some transformation on your, um, you have an image, I'm sorry, uh, data, you apply some trans uh, transformation on your data, which is just uh, here translation. Okay. If you apply the convolution, for example, with um, a line detector, this guy, okay, you would get this, and and you know, and and it's going to be the same. That uh, again, if you do the the, the translation, you're going to be here. So if you do that, then it's the same as doing also that. Okay, so this is where you get the symmetry and, and equivalent uh, property. Okay, so convolutional neural networks they are translation invariant uh, equivalent um, by design. Okay. So, so, so this is this is um, um, uh, okay. So this is this is this is nice. They are going to capture the translation, uh, the translation symmetry of, of data. Now they are not rotation, rot rotationally uh, equivalent. Okay. So if your image, you know, is going to translate, then they are not going to be um, so good at recognition. So what you need to do, um, uh, which is usually um, um, which is usually uh, carry out is uh, to do data augmentation. So you take your image, you know, you do some uh, random rotation of your image, and then you 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 want your network to learn, you know, this kind of um, of transformation. Okay. Another thing that you can do uh, if you want uh, your uh, data to be rotationally uh, equivalent is to give this uh, symmetric uh, this symmetry structure uh, to your network. So this is a generalization of convolutional neural network. By um, uh, Taco Cohen and, and Max Welling, um, and, and the idea is basically okay. Instead of looking at you know um, the group symmetry of uh, only convolution, I'm going to look at the group symmetry of convolution and rotation. Okay, so so for for medical images, you know it has a lot of sense because sometimes you know uh, you don't care about the rotation, so you want something which is um, designed for rotation as well. Okay, so the, you can do that also for mesh convolution. Um, so why symmetry and equivalence matter? So actually, they are great inductive biases. Um, you know, this is the game of, of deep learning. The idea is um, you want to find some um, um, like minimal structure that is universal to, uh, to, to some kind of data. And then you want to design uh, layers that is able to capture this, this, uh, this minimal structure. So convolution is, is uh, translation and convolution is one of these. And, and if, if you have that, then suddenly you know you don't need to uh, to learn too much parameter as you would do for an MLP, and you're going to train faster and you are going to better generalize. Okay, so they are very important. If you can, uh, you know, identify this uh, symmetry and invariance for the task that you need to solve, that's something um, uh, you will see. Uh, you will see a lot of progress. Okay, so um, so MLP multilayer perception. Okay, so this is the simplest uh, neural network you can do for vectors, right? So if your input is a vector, uh, what is, you know, um, the, the, the simplest neural network you can do to process this vector? This is an MLP. What is an MLP? Remember, this is a composition of linear function followed by nonlinear activation like we do. And, and then finally, so you will get um, a final layer for classification regression. Okay, so you have your n linear layers, uh, you go from n dimension to again uh, output of n dimension okay uh, and here you have your um, uh, classification regression layer which would go from n dimension to k dimension so k again it is one if uh, it is regression and if it is 10 if you have the m-list classification uh, task to do 
Okay, so this is um, this is an MLP. So you can ask the question: What is an MLP for for graphs? You know, what is the simplest neural network you can do for graphs? Um, and the answer is given um, by uh, Hagai Maron and 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 um, Yaron uh, Lipman and, and they and their co-authors is basically uh, equivalent uh, graph neural network. So it's a composition of uh, equivalent uh, linear layers followed by uh, nonlinear activation like Rilou. Uh, then you have an invariant linear function, and finally uh, the uh, the linear function for classification regression. Okay, so you start with um, a graph adjacency matrix A of the size n by n. Then we go through L equivalent linear layers. So remember the definition. Uh, you want this to be um, invariant with respect to um, uh, node uh, uh, to index uh, reparametrization. Um, okay, so you want to satisfy this equation. Then um, before the uh, classification uh, layer, you want you know to go from n to, to k, but you want to uh, satisfy again. Um, the, the index or parameterization uh, constraints. So you're going to have, you know, invariant um, linear layer here. Okay. Okay, so now the question is, um, you know, um, how to characterize this function f and this function g? Okay, the equivalent function f and the invariant uh, function g. Okay. So, so if you have, um, um, yeah, again, so if you have your matrix, uh, your graph represented by uh, a matrix and by n, we want to fully characterize uh, all equivalent and invariant uh, function f and g. Okay, so the question is basically what are all these, uh, all these uh, functions, all these uh, functions f and g? Um, because you want to achieve, you know, maximal expressivity, uh, you want to find all these possible functions. Okay. So, so there is a theorem. Uh, basically, they say that in the case of you know n by n um, uh, uh, matrix, then you have a 15 possible equivalent functions and two possible um, invariant uh, functions. Okay. So the good news is that um, this number of uh, possible equivalent and uh, invariant uh, functions they are actually are independent of the number of nodes n. Okay. Um, so it means that, um, first of all, um, uh, you don't have, if n is, is really big, like, you know, uh, billions of, uh, uh, of nodes like uh, Facebook, um, then it's not going to be too much. And, and secondly, uh, you can transfer between different graphs, okay, of different size n. Um, also, that you know, they, they also study, you know, the general case for uh, order m uh, tensor, and basically, they, this is, you know, the characterization of the number of equivalent functions in the general case, and, and the number of uh, invariant functions. Okay, so here is maybe one slide um, um, to give you all the 15 equivalent functions. Okay, so you have a function from n to n, and you want to know all the functions which are uh, equivalent, okay. So, so uh, there are all these functions. So first of all, if you start with um, what I want to say, I will not go through you know, details of this, uh, of this function, but just what I want to say is that if A is a sparse uh, matrix like you have here, what happens you know, is that you are going sometimes to densify the matrix. You're going to have a full um, you know, matrix here. Okay. Um, Okay, so now how do you parameterize um, your uh, equivalent um, uh, uh, functions? Equi equivalent, yeah, uh, functions. So f of w. So f is the equivalent function, and w are going to be, you know, some parameters that you are going to learn by backpropagation. Okay, so how to go from, you know, um, one dimensional input to one dimensional output? Okay. So, so here you have only you know one dimension. Uh, here you have uh, as an input uh, one dimension as the output. Okay. So the number of parameters that you can learn are basically the number of um, possible equivalent functions and the number of possible um, you know uh, bias functions. So it's going to be seventeen uh, functions. Now, if you go from an input of d dimensions and you want to produce only one dimension as an as an output, so here you have d dimension as an input and here you have only one feature, then um, then it's fine. You can have, you know, uh, 17 times D uh, number of input feature um, learnable parameters that you can do. Okay. 
Now in the general case, when you have D dimensional input uh, to um, D prime um, dimensional output, you know, so N by N by D, and then you want to produce an output of N by N by D prime. So the number of possible learnable parameters is going to be 17 by D by D prime. Okay, so this is uh, the number of learnable parameters. Um, again, as I said before, is that, um, you know, some F of A are going to be uh, dense. So it means that the um, uh, complexity is going to be uh, quadratic with respect to the number of nodes uh, in your graph. Okay. So how do you run um, an equivalent GNN? So for this, you're going to start um, by um, constructing a matrix A which would be of the size n by n. So n by n is basically the number of, uh, n is the number of nodes. And the first dimension here is going to be the adjacency matrix, you know, so the connection between, um, between the nodes. Here you have d dimensions to, um, you know, encode the, the d dimensional node features, and you have d e dimensions to encode the h features. Okay, so this is going to be the input of your graph neural network. Okay, so the, the forward pass um, is going to be um, this guy. So uh, this is the equivalent uh, graph neural network. Um, and, and so you're going to have your input, which is going to be here. You're going to have, you know, L equivalent layers. Um, and here you're going to have your invariant layers and finally an MLP. So for each layer, again, uh, this is the number of parameters that you, 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 you're going to need to learn. Okay, the memory complexity is, is N square. Um, and remember that. Um, that the message passing graph neural network has a complexity of uh, n, which is linear. So here you need to pay a little more price, you know, because you have um, a, a full uh, matrix uh, n by n. Okay. So they show that basically that you can, um, you know, um, you can express the, the standard message passing as an equivalent GNN. Okay. In the paper. So the. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the um, expressivity power um, and the limitation of the expressivity power uh, of the original, uh, you know, uh, uh, WM um, test. Okay. So we we decided, you know, to use the um, WL uh, graph isomorphism test, you know, as a measure of expressivity representation power, uh, you know, of graph neural networks. So this is what we did at the beginning of the lecture. This is, you know, the idea of, of, of gene. Um, so, and, you know, the gene was designed basically to be um, as um, expressive as the original uh, WL test, okay. Um, the thing is the original WL test is um, something that is guaranteed to, um, you know, um, so if, um, if the two histograms, you know, of uh, two graphs are different, then the W test is guaranteed to give you to tell you, you know, if the two graphs are not isomorphic. What happens sometimes with the WL test is that um, it can produce the same, um, you know, um, histogram of colors, uh, but actually um, the two uh, graphs are not uh, isomorphic. So, so basically it can fail, you know, it can fail the isomorphic, uh, isomorphism test, you know. So let me give you an example here. So this is the graph number one, this is, um, you know, the molecular graph with the carbon. Um, if, you, if you apply um, the WL test, then you will have, you know, this histogram of colors. Here you have another uh, molecular graph, which is different from, from this graph. You can see the, the difference, um, but still, you know, it will produce the same histogram. So with respect to the WL test, um, actually these two histograms are the same. So these two graphs are actually uh, isomorphic. So you see, this is, this is not true. So, so the WL test, the original WL test, um, um, is not a necessary condition. Okay, for um, for um, for the same for isomorphic graphs. Okay, so so there are some limitations with the original WL test, and uh, the question is, can we improve, you know, the original uh, the original test? And and the answer is yes. We can increase, you know, the expressivity power um, of graph neural network. And how we do that? So if you look at the original test, the, the thing that we used to design the coloring function is that we use uh, two tuples of nodes to produce uh, colors. Okay, so we just, you know, looking at 
uh, if, for example, the vertex i, and then the neighbors, the neighbor two. If you want to increase the uh, expressivity power of your of your function, what you need to do is to uh, produce more colors. Okay, to produce more colors, we just need to look at you know uh, more uh, interactions between the nodes. So we need to look at k tuple of, of nodes, for example, three. Okay, so um, when we look at two tuple of nodes, this is uh, very standard. They are the edges that we know very well. Okay. Uh, but when we look at, you know, three tuple of nodes, uh, like, you know, I, uh, J, and R, then we are looking at, you know, hyper uh, edges. Okay. So there are three tuple of nodes. And in these cases, um, what this, um, you know, um, this will uh, help us to uh, distinguish non isomorphic graphs with what we call um, the three WL test. So here you have you know a number. This is um, three WL test that for three tuple of nodes. Uh, two WL test for two tuple of nodes. Okay, and we generalize to k WL test when we consider k tuple of nodes. All right. So of course, um, um, what we want now is to relate this uh, k WL test with um, you know the um, the equivalent uh, GNN. Okay, so we are going to define um, k order equivalent GNN. Okay, how we define that? So we still have you know the same architecture as before, and remember that the equivalent function f go from you know n to the power of k uh, l for the layer l to n to the to the power k l plus one for the next layer uh, l plus one. Okay, so we are going to call this. Um, uh, this network, you know, k uh, order equivalent GNN, and k is going to be defined as the maximum uh, of this value kl for all layers. So you just take, you know, the maximum power uh, here. Um, so for example, if we want, uh, you know, um, a tree order equivalent GNN, so there would be uh, a k of l, which will be equal to three, okay, in the network. Um, okay, so, and then there is this, uh, this, uh, this theorem say that there exists uh, a k order uh, equivalent GNN that can distinguish non isomorphic graphs with the kWL test. Okay, so this is exactly what we want. Um, this is an existence result. Um, if you use stochastic gradient descent, uh, there, you, you, may, you may find it or you may not find it, you know. And also, this, this result is not a practical result. Okay, so, uh, so remember, you know, for gene, which is um, a message passing uh, GNN, which is as po a powerful as uh, the original WL test. And, and, and for this um, network, the expressivity power is actually uh, 2WL. Okay, this is 2WL. This is the capacity of this network to distinguish uh, graphs uh, with respect to the 2WL test. Um, now, if we want to beat uh, Gene, if we want to, to do better, then it means that we need at least to go to K equal to 3. Okay, we need a, a three W L uh, G N N. But if you put k equal to three, what it means? It means that there would be, um, you know, um, a tensor here of the size n to the power of three. So the complexity in this case would be uh, cubic. Okay, for the memory and also for um, the speed. Okay, so so we have this um, issue is that. Um, we want to reduce, you know, the cubic um, complexity. Uh, we want something which is a 3 w, 3 wl because uh, the standard message passing GNN, uh, they are all basically able to do the 2 wl um, or more or less, actually, it's, uh, theoretically it's less, but, but it's more or less, you know, 2 wl um, so, so the question now is, can we reduce, you know, this complexity uh, such that you know we can do some uh, big uh, graphs. Okay, so so there was this idea, three uh, W uh, L G N N, by uh, by Hagai Maron, um, um, uh, Yaron Lipman, and their co-author, is okay. What we can do actually is that yes, we can reduce you know the memory complexity from cubic to uh, quadratic, if we uh, use uh, you know um, um, if we if we design, you know, interaction between nodes by matrix multiplication, okay? So if we do matrix multiplication, then each matrix will basically cost, you know, n square in memory. Um, 
and then we will be able to get you know the three W L um, you know um, um, power um, uh, yeah. Um, so how does it work? Basically, uh, the idea is okay. You 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 have your um, your H, which is a tensor n by n uh, by d, which is the number of features. Okay, and what you're going to do is that you're going to apply you know an MLP um, on on H, another MLP on H, and then you are going to do the matrix matrix simplification. Okay, um, then you are going to concatenate with another MLP, and you will go to the to the next layer. So when you do that, uh, again, you see that uh, the memory complexity will reduce to uh, n square um, because you have you know, um, a matrix of n square here and here. But the speed complexity will be you know, n cube because when you multiply two um, n square matrices, then uh, the complexity is n cube. OK. A related method to uh, 3WL GNN is a ring GNN um, by uh, Joan Bruna. Uh, and is um, is co-author. Um, basically, um, it's it's the same idea that you want you know to have um, more higher um, order uh, interaction between your nodes by multiplying um, um, basically matrices. Okay. Uh, here, the matrices um, is actually um, uh, not simply MLP. They are actually equivariant, you know, uh, linear layers. But this is the, this is basically the same idea. So you see that you're going to have you know. Um, F applied to H, uh, and then the matrix multiplication by F applied to H. Okay. So and F is is, is all the equivalents, you know, uh, linear uh, layers that we, we have seen before. Okay. All right. So um, so you see the game. The game is basically um, the original uh, GNN um, has uh, express expressivity power of two WM. So what we want, we want, if we want to be them, you know, we want to go to 3WL uh, at least. If we want to go to 3WN, if we use equivalent uh, GNN, then we need a lot of you know, memory and, and speed, which is n cube. So we can reduce, um, we can reduce that, you know, um, for example, with matrix, matrix multiplication. And the game is again to improve you know, this uh, complexity. So, um, so so if you look at you know, the original equivalent um, K uh, GNN, um, what, what happened is that, um, um, so the, the original network actually used you know, all possible K topole of nodes. Okay? So in the graph, you may have you know, some um, K topole of nodes that exist, but sometimes you have some K topole of nodes that, that do not exist. But in the original um, WL GNN, uh, we, we use all k topole of nodes, even the one that did not exist. Okay, so so the idea of uh, sparse k w n n um, by Morris and and his co-author uh, is basically to look at only you know the existing um, you know k topole of nodes. So 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 it's 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 it's, it's an important idea because um, you want to only use you know uh, the you want to use the sparsity of your graph and not. And because sparsity is a very good inductive bias, you know this is uh, if you look at you know molecular uh, graphs, you know the way that the atoms are connected to each other. Uh, this is your uh, this is the sparsity of your graph. This is the topology of your graph, and you don't want to use like um, you know non-existence uh, connection between the nodes. So so for for generalization, this is something very important. Okay. So in sparse KWHGNN. They only use, you know, the k-topole of nodes present in the graph, and they show that it's more powerful than the dense one. Okay, and it's also, you know, um, uh, provide uh, better generalization, uh, you know, a smaller generalization error than the dense one, which is exactly what we want, and and, and it makes sense. Okay, so um, memory and speed complexity are improved, but still, you know, we need to use the all the k-topole of nodes present in the graph, which which can be, you know, um, uh, memory and, and time consuming. Okay, so again, uh, going in this direction of reducing the complexity, uh, we have uh, low rank um, uh, attention graph neural network. So, okay, so we, <clears throat> um, what we want is basically um, find a way, maybe an alternative way uh, to design message passing uh, GNN, um, which can be, you know, as powerful as the 3WL test, you know. Um, so in this paper, 
um, they use the message passing and they augment uh, the message uh, passing graph neural network uh, with a global attention module. Okay. And, and they can show actually that uh, this improved the express, expressivity power to the, to the two folklore WL uh, test, which is equivalent to the three WL test, which is the one we want, you know, for, for better expressivity. Um, the thing is, when you use global attention, um, you know, uh, this is transformer. So you know that the big bottleneck with transformer is, you know, this uh, N square. Uh, you know, attention matrix. Um, so you, you're going to get, you know, n square memory and n q for uh, for the computation. So, so uh, of course, today there is a lot of works uh, with transformer to reduce this um, bottleneck. And and here in this paper, they use a low rank approximation, okay, uh, for the global attention. Um, and this actually reduces the complexity to um, to linear, okay, for the memory and for for the speed. Um, because k, which is the um, which is the the the, the rank uh, value, which is is going to be of course very small compared to the number of nodes. Okay, so the way they do it, you know, is is very natural to do it, very natural to implement in the message passing uh, framework. Um, so you see that um, the um, the feature at the next layer will be a concatenation of the feature at the current layer. Then you're, you're going to have, you know, your favorite, um, you know, um, GNN layer here, and then you, you're going to have, you know, this um, uh, low rank global attention uh, here, A uh, X uh, L, and basically this is, you know, uh, something that uh, will be, um, uh, you know, computed like this. So you're going to have a, an MLP uh, apply on X, and then you have, you know, um, an MLP. Uh, which would be, so M is N times K. Here you're going to have also uh, N times K. Transpose is going to be K times N multiplied by um, 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 N, by N, N times K. So you will get a K by K. So this is where you get, you know, the low, the, the low rank, you know, um, global attention here. Uh, okay, and then here it's just, you know, normal, normalizing uh, factor. Okay, so, um, and then, so you need to show that this graph neural network um, is as powerful as the 3 So uh, the way it is done in the paper is to assume that the graph is actually a rich feature graph. Okay, and for rich feature graph, we know that um, the the GNN is actually uh, universal. Okay, it means that you can approximate any arbitrary continuous function uh, over this class of graph of rich feature graphs. You know, so what is a rich feature graph? So a rich feature graph um, is a graph. Uh, where all the structural and feature information um, is contained in the node feature. Okay, um, so 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 what it means? It means that uh, if you look at you know the node feature y, uh, so between uh, I'm sorry the the edge feature uh, y, which is y i j, you know for the pair of nodes i and j. So this actually can be represented by uh, a scalar product x i times x j. Okay, so it means that all edge information are contained in the node information, in the node feature, okay? Uh, so I can, so, so yeah, if you have two pairs of nodes, i and j, and i prime and j prime, you're gonna have the same isomorphism type, you know, if um, the, the, the feature node xi is equal to uh, xi prime and xj is equal to xj prime, you know? So this basically means that all the edge information is contained inside the node uh, feature, okay? Um, and you can represent, you know, if you have um, any uh, adjacency matrix A and you have a way to have a unique node representation uh, C, then you can show that this matrix Y, um, you know, represent uh, the isomorphism type of uh, any graph, basically. But you need to have a unique node representation, which is, which is sometimes very hard to get. So, so why do we make this assumption? The assumption that the graph is a rich feature graph is because if you look at, you know, most real world graph, you know, like uh, e-commerce uh, graph, usually you have a lot of features for, you know, each product, for example. And because you have a lot of uh, features, it, it means that they are some kind of rich. They are some kind of enough, um, they have enough information about, uh, you know, um, the graph structure. So it's, it's a, I think it's a, it's a good assumption uh, for real world uh, graph. Okay. So to prove uh, finally that um, you get the, uh, 3 WL um, power, which is equivalent to the two folklore WL. Uh, so they prove that there is actually uh, an algorithmic alignment between um, the, 
graph neural network that they propose and, and, and the theory, which is here. So I'm not going uh, into detail of, of the theory. You can, you can look at you know, uh, the paper and, 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 and that's it. Okay. All right, so now let me uh, talk about the graph structure networks. Introduce my Michael Bronstein and, and, um, and his co-author. Um, so again, you know, this is related to the idea that, um, so some key topol of nodes, um, they, can be, um, they can be informative and they can be actually uh, very meaningful to some specific uh, classes of graph. You know, so for example, if you look at chemistry, you know in chemistry that, that you have cycles. Okay, you have cycles like this, so they are uh, molecular rings. Um, you, you also have in social networks, you know, clicks. Uh, so here, for example, you have a three, uh, three, three click, and here you have a four click. So it means that all the nodes are connected to each other. Uh, in this graph, you, um, you know, the dark blue, basically you have a four uh, vertex uh, click and the same here. Okay, and then you have uh, three vertex clicks, two vertex click, one vertex click. Okay, so this, um, um, this k-topol of nodes, um, they, they can be uh, enough, you know, to, good, uh, to, to provide um, uh, powerful graph neural networks. And, and this idea was actually uh, implemented in the graph uh, structure, uh, substructure networks. So wh what, what the author proposed is basically augment the standard message passing by using subgraph uh, isomorphing, uh, isomorphism counts. Okay, so here you have the equation of the message passing graph neural network. And what, what, what you can do simply is to add, you know, this structural information for uh, the node i, the node j, and the edge uh, i, j. Uh, that basically uh, are the, you know, the, the clicks or the number of, of rings uh, in, your, in your molecule, for example. Uh, okay. So the thing is, this will be um, uh, pre-computed, uh, you know, so there will be a pre-processing step, and this will be used, you know, uh, in the message passing uh, neural networks. Yeah, one thing I want to say is that, um, so you cannot, if you use a standard um, message passing, GNN, uh, you can prove actually that you cannot identify cycles, uh, clicks, path, um, because basically uh, they are not able to look at more than two topol of nodes, okay? So if you want to be able to get a cycle, you need maybe, you know, three, four, five, uh, you know, nodes to, to be able to identify them. So, so the original message passing uh, GNN, they are not able to do that. So you need to have, again, something which is going to use K uh, topol of nodes. Um, okay. So the properties of this model is that um, this is something interesting because it's going to, uh, to make a bridge between some uh, techniques that are, you know, uh, have been developed in the literature, which are network motifs and graphlet uh, techniques. Okay, so it is a way to make a connection between uh, these two, um, the, these two uh, methods. Uh, the complexity is is uh, is 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 good because it's it's linear with respect to the number of nodes. Uh, so when you run your message passing, uh, it's going to be it's going to be of the order of n. Um, uh, what you need. Uh, uh, what you need to uh, more, uh, to where the complexity is higher is when you, you need to do this uh, pre-processing step of computing, you know, uh, some, um, uh, some uh, s property of isomorphic accounting, okay? So you need to look at all possible k-topols to see if they have the properties that you want to, to, to retain. Um, so substructure graph, um, structure, sub graph structures like uh, rings, um, uh, cycles, so they are encrafted. Okay, so, so this kind of technique is basically more specific technique. So if you know that uh, your data um, has this, you know, um, um, topological properties and you can, you know, extract these topological properties, um, then you would like to use them, you know, to, uh, to solve your, uh, your task uh, at hand. Um, so, but basically it, it will require, you know, prior domain knowledge. So for some application, this is good if you can identify uh, the right prior, okay. Uh, and they have also universality result, um, which, which is not practical because it's the order of, of, of the size of the graph, but at least you know you can prove that you have universality. Um, and then you, uh, the properties, um, they are something which is of course more powerful than the standard uh, message passing, so 2WR. And, and for example, for these regular graphs, um, so for this, if you want to differentiate these two graphs, you need something which is a four click and here, which is a three click, 
So you need something which is at least more powerful than the 3 WN uh, GNN, which, which they can get, you know. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about um, expressivity power and universal uh, approximation. Okay. Um, so um, it, when, when we decided to use the WL test, what we decided to do is that we are going to compare you know, the expressivity power of GNN with respect to this test. Okay, so this is a choice. So here you can, for example, have this axis, you know, of expressivity power uh, hierarchy. Okay, so here this is like the low expressivity and then this is the higher expressivity uh, with respect to the WL test. So all the standard message passing um, GNN um, are basically less powerful than the one WL test then you have a gene, which is as powerful as the 1WL or 2WL test, okay? Uh, these models, they are uh, linear complexity. Uh, they scale very well. And this model, then, uh, for example, the 3WL uh, test and the ring GNN and also the, the work by Maurice, they are, you know, with higher complexity. But they, they are guaranteed. Um, so there is an existence theorem that you can get, you know, network, which is a 3WL. And then you can go to higher, um, you know, um, um, higher expressivity with a KWN, but then you, you will need to have a um, uh, complexity of uh, order K, okay? Okay, now let, let me talk about something uh, important, um, uh, which is a universal approximator and, and then um, also generalization. So let me start with universal approximator. So what functions can be approximated uh, with an MLP? So for this, it's a very old result. Uh, you know, um, uh, you all you all know in neural network is that you have the universal approximation theorem. Any continuous function can be arbitrarily, you know, approximated by MLP under the necessary condition that you know the number of hidden neurons go to infinity or at least are very very large. Um, okay, so it's good. It means that uh, you can approximate anything basically, any any complex uh, function. Uh, now the question is what function can be approximated with the MLP for graphs, which is the equivalent GNN. Um, and then you can show that you can actually approximate any uh, function invariant by index permutation um, with an equivalent GNN under the condition that, um, you know, the, the order of this equivalent GNN is, uh, you know, N square. And N is the number of nodes, which is really huge uh, because if N is, is social network like Facebook, uh, N is billions. Um, so, so this is, uh, yeah, so this is something uh, which is, you know, you have this um, universal approximation, but it's not really uh, practical, okay. So this result was improved actually by, um, so Gabriel Perret uh, and, and Kerry Van, um, which is independent now of, of the number of nodes. Um, it's an upper bound, um, but we, but yeah, but the value is not known. Okay, so, so, so this slide I think is important. Um, so uh, universal approximation, okay, if you have uh, universal approximation for functions defined on graphs and then expressivity power, representation power to distinguish, you know, non-isomorphic graphs. So I think there are, you know, important and necessary conditions to design good uh, graph neural networks. Um, it's something like, you know, um, yeah, again, necessary conditions, but they do not guarantee that you will have, you know, strong generalization performance. And I think this is important that sometimes, you know, if you see like, you know, you have this universal approximator, you think that your network is, is gonna be, you know, uh, very good in practice. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you have enough, you know, um, expressivity power to represent any complex function. But it doesn't mean that it's going to generalize. It's two different things. Um, so for example, if you take an MLP, we know that um, it's a universal approximation for any function, but we don't use an MLP for computer vision. We use the convnet. And, and the same for graph, you know, um, if you look at gra equivalent uh, graph neural network, they are MLP with permutation invariant functions, but they do not generalize, you know, uh, as well as, for example, you know, graph attention uh, network. Okay. So, so, so my, my point here uh, uh, is basically. Um, Universal approximation, expressivity power are important, but what is probably more important for me is basically what is the right inductive bias for the problem that you want to solve. Um, 
and and if you if you are able to capture the right you know um, uh, symmetry invariance from your data, then it will lead you know to very good performance. Uh, uh, so 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 for example here I want to show you uh, you know um, uh, the combination of graph neural network with physical constraints like you know Hamiltonian mechanics. Uh, so you see you're going to see like you know particles moving. You're going to have you know the true solution, and then you have your graph neural network solution. So you, so you see that um, you are able basically to be very close to the to the ground truth solution. Okay. So this was you know the work by um, um, Kyle uh, Kramer, um, um, uh, and 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 it's it's a it's a very nice work you know uh, making the bridge between physics and and and, and machine learning and graph neural networks. Here is also very impressive results. You know you can do computational free dynamics, which uh, usually takes a lot of um, um, a lot of time, you know, to, to do it with graph neural networks, and you can see basically you can you can get really amazing results. And again, it's it's because you are able to uh, find you know very good inductive biases uh, here related to the physics of, of, of the problem, and you are able to design uh, you know graph neural network with these particular inductive biases. Um, and I think you know this is the point of graph neural network. If you use graph neural network alone, it's not going to be uh, very good. So you need to identify you know. Uh, additional, um, you know, structural invariances that that you can add to your graph neural network, and then then you have a successful story. Okay, so um, of course, um, uh, this relation between um, universal approximation of function, um, exploitative power with respect to the WR, and and you know k um, k equivalent uh, GNN. Um, I mean, they are all related to each other. Um, they are the same. So um, if you have one property, they are actually equivalent to the other property. Okay, so it's something which I think makes sense. Um, if you have universal approximation, it means that you have also, um, you know, um, you are also able to solve the WL uh, graph isomorphism, and 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 for this you need uh, a k equivalent, uh, you know, an equivalent GNN of the order k for the order of the WL test. Okay. Now let me talk about the limitation of expressivity. So there was this interesting paper um, by um, Andreas Lucas, uh, what GNN cannot learn. Okay. So for this, you know, he, he proposed to study, you know, the expressivity power of message passive GNN with something which is important, which is uh, you have a node identifier. You know, for, for each node, you have a way to identify this node in a unique um, in, with a unique representation, which is not, you know, the original message passing, um, but uh, but here it's it's very important. Actually, it's important for many things. Okay, so and so you see that you have your node and, and, uh, identifier for node i here and node j here. Here you have the feature for node i, the feature for node j, and then you have the h feature i j. Okay, so this is the standard message passing uh, equations that you have here, and then so. Uh, so he proved that uh, for this message passing with this uh, unique node identifier, um, actually the message passing is um, is a Turing universal. Okay, um, so to get Turing universal is actually not too much. Uh, what you need, you, you need you know um, this function here and here to be uh, universal. So you can use an MLP. You need uh, the number of layers to be larger than the graph diameter. So fine. Okay, and you need the width uh, to be large enough. Um, uh, fine as well, but something which is important is that you need each node to be uniquely identified, which sometimes is, it's hard to get. I will come back to that. Um, yeah. So again, if you have the universal universality um, uh, representation, then you will have also the graph. Um, you know, you will be able to solve graph isomorphism problems. And again, you know, uh, what I want to emphasize is that um, um, universality doesn't mean that you know you get uh, um, um, good. Um, um, Generalization performance. So we, we need to be careful with that. Okay. So in in the study, you know, so something was very interesting. He said, okay, we have some impossibility results. It means that when the graph neural network, you know, um, are able or not, you know, to solve um, graph uh, graph theoretical problems. Um, so so for this, you know, he look um, uh, so he look at you know the capacity of the network, which is basically the number of layers times the hidden dimension. Okay, and then if the cap capacity is less than some um, uh, 
uh, then some value uh, and number of nodes to the power of something between uh, half and two. And then sometimes, you know, you cannot solve uh, these problems, okay? Like decision problems, uh, optimization problems, and estimation problems, uh, which are very um, basic fundamental problems in, um, um, in graph theory that you want your network to be able to solve these problems if, the, if, if you want to, to use them in the real world, okay? So it's, it's an interesting approach because it's alternate approach to study the expressivity power of graph neural networks. So uh, usually we look at, you know, the WL uh, um, test, but here we are looking at, you know, if they can solve this graph theoretical problem. Um, so when you use neural networks, uh, usually we, we it's, it's, neural networks for me is, is like, you know, the science of approximation. So it just, you want something that is able to solve most of the problems. So uh, here, the analysis is done in the worst case scenario, but I think the average case scenario would be more practical for, for neural networks. Okay. Um, so, um, another limitation of the expressivity power of graph neural network is, um, uh, is a phenomenon that we call, uh, you know, over squashing. So, when, when you have the, the standard message passing, uh, you know, equation, basically what you're going to do is that you are going to sum over you know, um, the node features, okay? And, and here, this is for the, for the layer M. So if, if you do that for layer one, layer two, layer three, what happens is that uh, at, at layer one, um, this node I will, will receive information from these two nodes in the neighborhood. Then at layer two, this node will receive the information from, you know, uh, these nodes in the neighborhood and so on and so on. So this is the very standard, you know, um, reception field. Uh, in, um, in conventional neural networks that you know that the number of nodes is going to grow, you know, um, uh, each time you are going to stack, you know, uh, an additional layer. And in the case of graph neural network, this will go exponentially uh, with the number of layers, okay? So here you have two neighbors, four neighbors, eight neighbors. Um, so you have this phenomenon of over squashing because you are going to, um, uh, aggregate, uh, you know, uh, two to the power n uh, number of uh, of features. So, so that's that that's that's something no network cannot do. You know, so we know that from LSTM, uh, an LSTM um, is limited because it cannot, you know, um, is not able to, uh, you know, um, summarize uh, one long sequence uh, with one vector. So this is here the same problem, um, and it's even actually it's even worse because it's it's exponential. Uh, number of uh, of neighbors here. So you cannot basically, it means that you cannot learn like a long, long range, you know, um, uh, long range um, uh, interaction between, between nodes. Um, so the solution proposed is basically, okay, uh, what we need to do is to have this long-term interaction. Uh, uh, interaction. Um, so to do that, it's uh, author, um, um, so Alan and uh, Yahav, they propose to uh, add uh, one layer which is going to be a fully connected layer uh, after, um, after the GNN layers, okay? So you see that here, the sum is not over the neighbors, it's over all the nodes uh, in the graph. So by doing that, you know, the information is going to uh, be accessible everywhere uh, uh, on, on the graph, basically because each node is connected to all other nodes uh, in the graph, okay? So, so by doing that, you know, you improve performance, you don't need to do much, it's just, you know, having one layer, um, here, uh, you're, you're going to increase the complexity from, uh, you know, uh, message passing is linear. Here is going to be a quadratic complexity. Um, yeah. All right, so now let's talk about graph positional uh, encoding. So, um, let me talk about uh, structural encoding and positional encoding. So structural encoding means um, basically GNN encoding, you know, so the, uh, the feature uh, represented, uh, computed by, by GNN. So, so there is a limitation uh, with GNN, like, you know, uh, any standard GNN. Uh, they are not able to differentiate representation of isomorphic nodes. Okay, what is a nice isomorphic node is basically a node which has the same neighborhood. So if you look at, for example, the fluor, the fluor, uh, you know, um, has the same neighborhood H here, same neighborhood H here. Um, and you can also look at, you know, uh, not only the one hop neighborhood, but you can look at, you know, the whole graph. So if you start here 
all the neighborhood is actually the same that if you start here, it's going to be completely symmetric. Okay. So for this molecular graph, uh, all um, you know, fluorine um, atoms have the same representation. All um, azote atoms have the same representation, uh, the carbon, uh, okay? And the, these two hydrogens have the same representation and these two hydrogens have the same representation. Okay, so this is an issue because um, uh, this uh, may have, you know, different, uh, you know, um, uh, function the, um, than, than this one, you know? So, 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 so this is a limitation of um, the standard graph neural networks. And, and this is due to the, to the basically, you know, to, to, the, to the symmetry of the graph. So you want to break this symmetry, how you can do that. So you can either use higher order W at G and N, but they are not practical. Or what you can do is that you can use some positional encoding of the nodes, you know, some basically, um, you know, um, some, um, yeah, some positional information of each node. Okay. Um, so, so what, what, what would be some good properties of positional encoding? So what you want, you want to have a unique representation for each node, um, of course, and then you want also something which is distance sensitive. So nodes that are far away on the graph should have positional uh, feature, you know, um, different, uh, like, you know, we, um, they should have, you know, um, higher distance than the nodes that are close to each other uh, on the graph. Okay. Now there, there, there is a limitation of um, this um, graph positional encodings um, due to the symmetry uh, in, uh, in graph. Okay. Um, so for example, let's say that, you know, you have this uh, molecular graph. Um, if node i, uh, okay, uh, um, you know, yeah, so yeah, so node i and j, so this uh, this uh, fluorine atom and this fluorine atom here, they are structure structurally symmetric, okay, they are strictly symmetric. Um, so if you if you decide that the position encoding for this is a, and this position encoding for this atom is, I'm sorry, is is b, I'm sorry, it should be a b. <laughs> It's, it's a typo, it should be AB and here it should be BA, okay? So if you decide, uh, you know, this is A, this is B, actually it's also uh, possible to choose having, you know, position encoding B here and position, position encoding A here, okay? So, so we need to understand that the, the graph position encoding are always arbitrary up to the number of graph symmetry, okay? So you may have some graph symmetry and the position encoding will not be able, you know, to, um, you know, to distinguish between the graph symmetry. So, so it just, you know, uh, something which is a limitation. Okay. So um, the simplest uh, index position encodings that we can think about is to use, you know, the indexing of the nodes. Uh, okay. So, the, so, um, so if you have a graph like this, you know, you can have this uh, indexing of the nodes. So this is the index seven, the index two. Um, and and you have and the post, the number of possible um, indexing of the nodes is n factorial if you have n nodes. Okay, um, so uh, so there is a theorem by um, Bruno Ribeiro and and his uh, co-author basically that uh, you can take any G and N and if you if you use the um, the index positional encodings you can improve uh, actually the expressivity uh, of 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 your G and N. Okay, so the thing. Um, which is not practical is that we need to consider n factorial, um, you know, um, permutation of the node in indexing. So what what we do in practice is basically we uh, uniformly sample, uh, you know, from the n, n factorial possible choices, you know, because we want the system to be able to learn uh, to be independent with respect to this um, arbitrary choice of uh, node indexing. But but they are too much. So the only thing we can do is to sample. Okay. Um, all right, um, so we would like to use again this um, indexing of nodes uh, to represent uniquely, you know, um, uh, the nodes. Um, so uh, to do that, um, we are going to use structural message passing uh, network from um, uh, Andreas Lucas and his collaborators. And the idea um, to use um, this um, indexing of the nodes is to augment the node representation with uh, a graph size equivalent module which is here. Okay, so this is your graph, you know, 
um, this is the, the node um, which is indexing by the number three. Okay, and then you can apply some um, uh, permutation of your nodes. Then this time it will be the number four. Okay, so the color uh, is basically uh, the feature. And you see that for each node of the graph, you're going to have, you know, this matrix view, uh, which is going, you know, basically to contain um, the feature of the other nodes. And this will be, you know, uh, equivalent. So the row of the matrix will be simply permuted if you do some uh, node reordering. Okay, and you see that. So this is number three, the green is here. And now if, if this is number four, uh, the feature is going to be here. Okay. So, so this is this is this is this is a good idea because this way you know you can start. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you can you can use uh, a unique node uh, identifier, um, which is the indexing of your uh, of your graph, and then you can use that you know without ambiguity and without having to use the n factorial possible permutation. And, and the implementation is 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 like you know uh, message passing uh, graph neural networks, which is here. Uh, the only thing, of course. Um, the way you can get, you know, um, to be uh, equivalent with respect to the node um, um, identification is by having, you know, by augment with, uh, you know, a, a, a matrix here. Okay, so the price that you need to pay is basically to uh, get from uh, linear complexity to n square complexity. Okay. Um, um, okay, so the property, uh, again, uh, which is very nice, is that you have a unique node identifier by using the, um, uh, the node uh, indices without ambiguities and, and, and neither, you know, combinatorial explosion. Explosivity power, so um, they show that uh, they can differentiate two nine on uh, isomorphic graph. They are also universal. Um, they are strictly more powerful uh, than the standard message passing because you have this unique node uh, identifier. And they can exploit, you know, graph sparsity. Um, and the but but the memory is uh, n square, and and the speed also n square. So you can have some approximation to reduce to to n. Um, yeah, uh, and and they show basically, um, you know, good performance for uh, many graph theoretical uh, problems uh, where um, the standard message passing G GNN uh, fair. Okay, so an alternative uh, way to um, to the index um, positional uh, encoding for graphs is to use the Laplacian positional encoding. So this is something that we introduce um, in this paper. Um, so what are uh, Laplacian eigenvectors? So, so this, this, uh, this is a, a spectral technique that is going to embed a graph in a, in a Euclidean space. Okay, so this will produce a local coordinate system while preserving the global structure of the graph. Okay. So how do we get, you know, this coordinate system? So we, we use the graph Laplacian. So here, this is the normalized uh, graph Laplacian where you have the degree matrix, the adjacency matrix, and then you do a factorization. Uh, you have a matrix of eigenvectors, which are your Laplacian uh, functions. You have your eigenvalues here. Computational complexity is the number of edges, um, power 1.5. And you can also approximate that with, for example, nice from uh, method, and it's gonna be linear. Um, so Laplacian eigenvectors, they are um, interesting because they are hybrid uh, between positional and structural embeddings, which are also invariant with respect to index permutation. And they are unique and distance sensitive. So again, if you have two nodes far away, then the distance between the positional encoding will be, will be large and inversely for two nodes uh, close to each other. Um, of course, uh, you have the problem of graph, uh, you, you have some symmetry problem with Laplacian uh, position encoding because um, the eigenvectors you know can flip. Um, when, when you compute the factorization of your Laplacian, then you can have, you know, um, the eigenvector, which are defined up to the sine plus, plus or minus one, okay? So the number of possible flips is two to the power of k, k is the number of eigenvectors. Uh, of course, k is much smaller than the size of your graph. Um, so you have, you know, less sampling to do, less, you know, ambiguity for the network to learn, but still, you know, um, this can be a limitation. Uh, okay, so one thing which is interesting in relation to uh, transformer positional encoding, so probably you know uh, well that you cannot use transformer itself um, because it's, it's a set neural network. It doesn't have any ordering of the words. So you need to have some positional encoding to tell you, you know, the distance between the words. And what transformer uh, use uh, is basically, you know, cosine and sinusoid uh, functions. Um, and, 
and, and Laplacian positional encoding. So they are basically graph generalization of, of, this, of these sinusoids and, and, and cosine functions. Because for, for NLP, um, you, the graph is basically a line graph. When you compute you know, the Laplacian eigenvector for the line graph, you get the cosine and the, and the sinusoids. Okay, so yeah, so you, you can show basically that, so there are for graph theoretical uh, problems that um, if you use that, uh, you get, you know, um, good performance on, um, um, you know, on, for example, um, uh, isomorphic graphs, uh, detecting uh, cycles, um, and also, um, um, you know, uh, graph theoretical problems like maybe, uh, you know, computing shortest distance, um, uh, diameter of the graph and so on. Okay, now let's uh, talk about the link prediction problem uh, with graph neural networks. So there, there, there is also a limitation um, uh, with graph neural network when you want to solve the, the link prediction problem. And let me uh, show you what is this limitation. Um, so um, let's say we have this molecular uh, graph here, which is composed of two compounds. So this is the first compound, the second compound, and they are, you know, connected here, okay. So if you apply your favorite GNN, what happened is that, um, so the representation of the fluorine here and here would be the same. And the representation of the hydrogen here and here would be the same, okay? Um, because everything is um, basically isomorphic. Um, so, so now if you want to perform link prediction, let's say for example, there is uh, you know, a bound between these two atoms here, um, what you expect is that we have also a bond with these two atoms here, okay? So, so, um, so fine, you know, uh, we can predict, you know, um, this bound if we know there is this bond here. But the problem is that because, because you have the same representation for um, these two, oops, these two uh, atoms here, um, these two atoms here and here, and here and here, then you are going also to predict wrong uh, bounds uh, here and here, okay? So this um, limitation was identified by, um, by uh, Bruno Ribeiro and um, uh, Srini uh, Bassan. Um, and basically they say that if you want to design graph neural network with maximal, uh, maximal expressivity for, uh, for the link prediction task, what, what you need is basically a joint representation of, of nodes, okay? Um, you need to have a joint representation between all nodes, okay? So this requires, um, you know, n square. Uh, complexity because you need to encode you know, all uh, edge representation. Uh, so for example, if you want to um, you know, solve uh, the previous uh, issue, for example, you can use as a um, you know, joint representation of nodes, uh, for example, the shortest distance. Okay, so the shortest distance between uh, H and F is gonna be uh, one, two, um, and then uh, you're gonna also have one, two, but then if you do the shorter distance between this hydrogen and this fluor, you're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, okay? So, so you, can, you can disentangle you know, the, the, this problem of link prediction uh, if you use joint representation of nodes. Uh, we propose as an alternate solution to use again the Laplacian positional encodings. Um, it's a way to, to speed up um, the, the problem. Okay. So um, for the last, um, um, the last part of the, of the talk, I'm, go I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about graphs. Um, actually, I'm gonna talk about sets. Um, so, um, so they are all tensor, right? So this is a tensor um, uh, of order one, tensor of order two, and then tensor of order n. Um, so the sets are represented by, uh, you know, um, first order tensor, graph second order torsor and then order n tensor. Okay, so you have um, uh, no edge, you have edges and you have hyper edges. Um, okay. So, so we can apply, you know, um, equivalent uh, graph neural networks uh, to sets um, because it's, it's a general, um, you know, analysis that is true for a tensor of any order. Okay, so for sets, the, the order of the tensor is one. Okay, so for rank one tensor, um, uh, and the sets are represented by vectors, the equivalent linear functions, um, we can 
are fully characterized by uh, two equivalent functions. Okay, this is a theory. We know that, that they have two of them, which is the uh, identity matrix, and you know uh, this is the, um, the 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 square matrix uh, full of one minus the identity matrix. Okay, so so yeah, so the equivalent linear uh, transformation f. Uh, are basically defined by this equation. Okay, so you have uh, a parameter that you can learn, W1 xi plus W2 and the sum of uh, all j uh, different of i um, uh, of uh, xj. Okay, and again, this function is, um, you know, equivalent because f of p of x is equal to p of f of x, p times f of x. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the uh, invariant linear uh, transformation, uh, we can also characterize um, this function. Uh, we have one parameter here. So you see that right away that um, if you want to do NLP, natural language processing, um, uh, which is a set uh, of, of, of words, then you don't have too much, uh, you know, um, you don't have too much freedom um, because, uh, I mean, you don't have too much, I would say, um, you know, learning capacity because you only have, you know, two parameters that you can learn. Uh, so it has, you know, very limited performance, um, you know, and you can use, you cannot use that, you know, for, for NLP. It, it's not enough, you know, to, um, to, to, get, to, to get good performances. Um, so the question is, uh, so uh, uh, what, what to do, you know, for, for sets? So, uh, of course, for NLP, we know what to do. We, we, we should do transformer. So we should use, you know, attention uh, mechanism. Um, you know, to, to learn representation of the words depending on the context of the words. And this is, you know, nonlinear, uh, nonlinear aggregation function. So remember that um, the equivalent functions are linear. Okay, so uh, if we want to do uh, an NLP for something as simple as, as a set, um, we need something which is nonlinear. Um, and it is very successful. Uh, or what we can do is that we can um, also consider additional symmetry and invariance coming from the data. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So. Um, so, for example, um, you know, you can have a, a set of images. For let's say, for example, we have a set of images. So we can have two kinds of symmetries in, in this situation. So the first situation is that, uh, first of all, uh, let's say the, the set of images is represented by the matrix X, which you know uh, here you have uh, the number of images. And here, this is the number of features in each uh, image. Okay, so this is the image number I, uh, image number J. Okay, so first of all, it's a set of images. So we don't care about the order uh, of, uh, of images. So for, we can swap, you know, xi and xj, and it should not change, you know, the output of the algorithm. Okay, so we have a symmetry with respect to the to the ordering uh, of of the set. The second symmetry that we have, so if there are images, we know that translation is a very good, uh, you know, symmetry. Um, so so we have two kind of symmetry. We have set symmetry, uh, ordering variance, and we have data symmetry, translation invariance. Okay, so in the case of images, for example. Um, okay, so um, so th this idea of using both symmetry was, um, um, you know, introduced in deep sets and point uh, nets. The idea is basically, you know, um, to to uh, somehow you know concatenate first maybe the convolutional features, and then um, the um, the set uh, neural network. Um, so. So it was done in a separately in a, in a separate you know um, processing. So what was proposed in um, in in the paper by uh, Hagai Maro is basically to combine um, you know um, the two symmetries uh, simultaneously. Okay. Um, so for this, um, uh, basically what they propose is to define a linear uh, equivalent um, you know uh, layer. For the group symmetry of you know um, the node ordering, and and the uh, the translation basically, which is which is this equation. Okay, so what you're going to do is that um, if you want um, to compute uh, the image at the next layer, what you will do is that you will apply first. This is the convolutional layer, which is here. So you have x one, you do the convolutional layer, you get this, and then you're going to add the sum of um, all the um, the the image. Um, uh, after the convolutional layer, okay, 
and then it will go to the to the next layer basically. So this is you know the way that you can define a linear equivalent layer for the group symmetry of uh, you know translation and and then um, uh, node uh, ordering. No, yeah. Um, so you have explicitity power. You can prove that that um, if uh, you know. Um, um, the, the, the data symmetry is, uh, is universal, then you can also prove that everything is, is universal uh, as well. Um, yes, um, so the expressivity power is less than deep set, um, but again, we need to be very careful with uh, expressivity power. What is important is the generalization performance. So, uh, and, and we can show in the experiments that actually the generalization performance is better, and it makes sense when you want to couple simultaneously, you know, um, the two symmetries. Uh, the data symmetry and the set symmetries. Um, yeah. So there are many possible applications you, you can think about by manipulating, you know, different symmetries. And you have this framework to um, basically combine symmetries. Okay, so for the material of this lecture, um, so I put, you know, in this link, um, uh, basically uh, the papers that I used to, um, uh, for, for this lecture, so, so you, can, you can download them if you, if you want to go into the details. All right, thank you.